Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Malone Jackson, and I'm the Deputy Director of Schaefer Museum. We're so grateful to each of you for supporting our work by joining us here tonight as we wrap up our annual summer series. Our work is made possible by our sponsors and individual supporters like you, and I encourage you to visit our website after this program to learn more about how you can become involved. The Shakers gave profound attention to issues of equity and inclusion, environmental sustainability, innovation, entrepreneurship, and social welfare, all while creating an extraordinary body of material objects, including but extending well beyond the quintessential Shaker chair and Shaker oval box. We are delighted to present tonight's program about mycelium in conjunction with the AIA New York Center for Architecture. And it's my pleasure to welcome our two presenters. Namita Modi of Modi Architecture and Design, LLC, leads a small design practice that focuses on private home commissions, residential development, and product design collaborations in the New York City region. In her 25 year long career, she's designed over a hundred projects, including an award-winning passive house, affordable housing, and rural conservation and sustainable prototype projects throughout the United States. Recently, she has designed ideas for small scaled interactive installations at her studio, Open Air Lab, in collaboration with New Incorporated, a museum led cultural incubator in New York City. She is co chair at AIA New York's Knowledge Committee, CRAN Custom Residential Architects Network since 2019, and is a mentor and educator to aspiring women architects in her community. Jonathan Desi Olive is a researcher, designer, and educator. His work takes a critical approach to technology and contributes to the broad disciplinary areas of sustainable building technology and computational design. Presently, he's an assistant professor in the School of Architecture at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where he teaches structures, architecture studios, and research seminars. Jonathan is also the director of Myco Matters Lab, a design and research practice that focuses on building scale applications of fungi-based materials. Welcome, Namita and Jonathan. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Lisa. And uh, thank you for inviting us here to speak in your summer series tonight. Um, we're really happy to be here. And um, Jonathan and I are both super excited to tell you about the Mycelium Project, um, which is a collaboration through AIA New York CRAN, Custom Residential Architects Network, one of 27 knowledge committees there. Uh, our committee's programs explore innovation in practice, design, and construction techniques emerging from working on custom residential commissions. Two years ago uh, and five months into the pandemic, we held our first program about mycelium architecture as a part of our ResArch lab series, which focused on innovation in materials. Because it was a webcast, we were able to bring leading mycophiles, building science experts, educators, and architects from all over the country to speak on the subject. And we drew a crowd of over 350 attendees from all over the world, including designers, engineers, educators, and students, and truly broadening our base community as a result. Um, so this overwhelming interest in mycelium inspired us to create a series of workshops based on a hypothetical residential commission, designing house parts from mycelium. Our client was the Glass House, which is a National Trust historic site in New Canaan, Connecticut. And Jonathan, who's here tonight, was one of the speakers at that event two years ago in August. And he eventually joined our team um, for this project, and he uh, was our, considered our myco expert or our uh, master builder on the project. Um, and the other members of our team included Nat Oppenheimer, uh, senior vice president at Silman Engineers, and his team of structural engineers, Rebecca Buntrek, who specializes in historic preservation and existing buildings, as well as Omid Olian, who's a computational designer and also an educator. Uh, together, over 18 months, our team, along with Jonathan's students at uh, KSU, designed the Corolla, 
a shading structure for the glass ceiling of our conservatory space within a home. We were able to share the Corolla in an augmented reality installation by shop architects installed at the AIA New York this past winter and spring. This fall and into 2023, we will continue to, to de develop this project. Um, the program tonight includes a presentation by Jonathan about mycelium, and then we will watch a portion of a video by our team, Rebecca and Omid, sharing their experiences on the project. And then Jonathan will come back and talk some more about his collaborations with his students' works. And finally, we will have a discussion with a question and answer at the end. So um, everyone in the audience, please feel free to use a chat function anytime during this presentation to ask questions or, or comments, um, and we'll do our best to get them answered throughout the program or at the end for sure. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to Jonathan now. Thank you so much, Namita. Um, well, I'm going to just go ahead and um, share my screen and I'll get started. So as Namita mentioned, um, I'm going to first, I'm going to speak in, in two different parts. Uh, at the beginning, I'm going to first introduce uh, the topic of, of mycelium materials, what that is. I'll give a little bit of background and I'll show some of the, um, the work that's been happening up until now but, uh, of using this material at building scale. Um, and then we'll break uh, and, and hear more about the project. Um, but so uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Jonathan Desi Olive. I'm an assistant professor uh, at uh, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And I should mention that some of the student work that you're seeing is at my old university at K-State. So if you hear me talk about Kansas State, um, just please understand that, that, that I, I switched jobs this summer and, and that's why. Um, but the work is continuing and, um, and let's, let's get into it. Seeing about is a combination of, um, of the root structure of mushrooms, which is called mycelium and uh, agricultural wastes or forestry wastes. And basically what we're doing is that we grow these uh, fungal hyphae, right, these fungal roots into agricultural waste um, in order to make a composite material. Now, when they're dried out, then they become uh, fairly useful. Uh, and, I'll and I'll get into how they're useful. But let's first get into the charge of why we might be wanting to use this strange material. Why would we want to grow a building? So I'll start with the contention here that in the current building culture, the lifespan of buildings is rapidly decreasing, while more than ever, the global construction industry still primarily uses materials that are rather permanent. So you're looking at two buildings here. The first is the Pantheon in Rome, well-known building. It's almost 2,000 years old. Uh, on the right uh, is the Georgia Dome. Uh, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia in 2017, about a month before that this structure was uh, demolished. Um, if you remember, it was built originally around 19, uh, 1992 for the 96 Olympics, and then it served um, as the football stadium in Atlanta thereafter, probably being used uh, a dozen times a year or so, maybe, you know, with football games and then counting probably some concerts and other events, not really being used very often. So here you have two buildings that were built originally as places for people to gather. And somewhere along the way, um, their cultural relevance and their cultural significance really diverged. Uh, the Pantheon on one hand is still someplace that 2000 years later, people come and flock to visit. Uh, and meanwhile, um, the stadium, the Georgia Dome became something that was ultimately obsolete for Atlanta. And really uh, when you look at it, um, buildings that last 2000 years versus 25 years, and yet they're still using similar, very permanent, very high energy materials such as concrete, um, I think we have to look at how long buildings are going to last if that's a part of our building culture today. And by the way, this is not something that is really just um, distinct to the Georgia Dome or even just Stadia in the United States. The average lifespan of buildings in China was recently reported to be about 34 years and 25 years in Japan for residential buildings. And if you look at, I mean, I've been kind of researching this at the level of stadia because I, they're very energy rich buildings that have very, very infrequent uses. Um, our buildings from the 1980s, 1970s, 80s of stadia are really falling right in this trend anywhere between 25 and 38 years. So very, very much on trend with the rest of the world. Um, and so what this really ultimately leads to is that we're not doing so well when it, in, in the architecture and, and building industry when it comes to building waste, 
because um, ultimately when we are demolishing this, these, this number of buildings so quickly, we end up producing a, a lot of waste in the order of 600 million tons of construction demolition waste just in 2018. Um, and that's reported by the EPA. So really we're getting down to this big question of how should we build for tomorrow? And if our buildings are gonna be lasting less long, what materials, what kinds of, of techniques do we need to be looking at in order to change our ways? So for uh, me and a number of other of my colleagues uh, in, in this research space, we're looking at fungi-based materials, this composite material um, in this context. So as I mentioned earlier, the, these materials are consisting of fungal hyphae that are binding these um, agricultural waste fibers. Um, they're grown at room temperature and in the dark, so it takes very, very little energy to actually grow these materials. Um, the time that it takes to grow them depends on the substrates, so the, the fibers themselves, the, nutri the nutrients that are available, and of course the fungal species, is are gonna, uh, different ones are going to grow at, at um, different, life or different rates. Um, and then finally, then this is really what makes this material, I think, so important and so interesting to many of us is that at the end of life, mycelium composite materials can be composted. Um, recent studies are showing that it takes about 45 days if you were to bury them and actively try to compose these materials. So we're, it's pretty good. So mycofabrication, what does this look like? Um, really, it's pretty simple. Um, it starts with, a, a, on the left, a bag of material. So you're seeing the white stuff that you're seeing in there are actually the living mushroom roots. Um, the microfabricator would then pull those fibers apart until they're a loose mulch, pack them into a mold, uh, and then grow those materials in that mold for, um, in, in the case of, of these materials, about a week. After which, those materials are then put into an oven and dried out completely. We are actually stopping the growth of these mushrooms, so we're not talking about using living materials as a part of our everyday lives, at least not in this context. Certainly, there is research that's looking at the way that living materials um, such as these could actually be a part of our lives. But at least for our discussion today, let's just assume that all of the materials as we grow them are intended to be dried out before they become useful to us. And there's a long history of these materials being used in a lot of different really interesting contexts. So here are some examples uh, on the screen of, of different kind of products, uh, lampshades, a lot of furniture has been made, um, certainly sculpture, acoustical panels, um, and even, uh, even some sort of fashion products. Um, but I'm talking about architecture today, so let's quickly get onto that. Uh, between, in the last uh, over 10 years, there have been many, many, many architects, designers, um, builders, engineers who have actually worked with this material and attempted them at building scale. Now, in the top row, I want to point out that these materials are tending to work um, structurally in the, in, the, in the top row, the three at the top row. So you're seeing this, this arch um, by Philip Ross, who uh, eventually um, founded the company MycoWorks. Um, in 2014, probably the most um, impactful uh, pavilion to date, um, certainly the largest. Here are these 40-foot towers that were uh, on display at the MoMA PS1 in New York City. Um, and then in 2017, uh, this, uh, this uh, what's called the Myco tree, um, which is actually showing these materials in a highly efficient shape. Um, working all in compression. Uh, the bottom row now you're seeing uh, are also large deployments of these materials, but used in non-structural ways um, in, 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 in most cases here. So one thing I do want to point out though, is that in all cases here, all of these structures are made with individual parts. So bricks, blocks, um, and there's all, and they're all made of some kind of aggregate of this. Even if you look at the bottom this bottom example here, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small, is made of 3D printed uh, mycelium parts that are stacked. But again, the only way that, uh, on, at least on this page in my examples here, that, that these structures are coming together is through the accumulation of parts. And this was something that when I started using these materials really took kind of as a critical point, as a critical point of, of new inquiry. Um, so this is uh, the Monolito Micelio, which is, uh, it's a performance pavilion that was made out of an entire casting of mycelium. So really looking at the way that we construct structures um, and, and really challenging this mater material to be used in a way that's maybe more like casting concrete than it is um, to build with brick. Um, after all, we do build with brick, we do build with blocks. But we don't do that ubiquitously. We have other uh, methods of construction. And I think it's worth thinking about new materials through multiple um, logics of construction. 
So just to take you very, very quickly on how this came about, basically it really was like um, a concrete uh, casting site. We had a very large mold that we made out of plywood. Um, you can see here students at Georgia Tech, which is where I was at the time, uh, both kind of taking these bags of mycelium and breaking them up in these in these bins. We also had this cement mixer in which we were tumbling um, various nutrients and moisture before the materials were then packed into the mold. Now, the interior of the mold was, uh, so sorry, the exterior of the mold was rigid, but the interior was actually made of fabric. So you're seeing here this woven nylon fabric that we're using um, to pack the mold. And really what that gave us was a very rigid, kind of very precise exterior and a very voluptuous um, kind of expressive interior. Now, ultimately, this pavilion was intended for and used uh, as a performance pavilion. And uh, the, the, uh, the students, after they were done singing in here, told me that they actually felt like they were in a recording studio. Um, and unsurprisingly, mycelium materials are known to have these kinds of acoustical properties. Um, so this is really kind of what kind of got me into this research space and ultimately is what um, facilitated me presenting um, at this at these sets of workshops that, that Namita was describing earlier and really kind of set the bar for how we were going to engage in this project altogether. So for the Mycelium project, uh, a number of years later after this pavilion uh, came about, um, consisted of a team which collaborated on a speculative design commission to renovate a conservatory space with custom parts made entirely out of mycomaterials. And this was really to address a critical gap of knowledge. And this is both in academia and in the industry. Um, this gap of knowledge that pertains to the broader deployment of mycomaterials in the context of residential architecture. As much as pavilions are interesting, um, they are they 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 really um, kind of lack the ability to to really solve larger problems of sustainability in the built environment. So, the collaborative exchanges um, that we were kind of engaged in, and then there were a lot of different people coming from a diverse set of backgrounds. Um, was to basically lay out how would a team collaborate with this material? When you don't have this knowledge, when that gap exists, how do you actually collaborate together? So these collaborative exchanges um, between a fictional client, an architect, structural engineer, computational designer, and a craftsman outline a framework for interdisciplinary collaboration, which is essential, really essential, uh, to scaling a new material technology in ways relevant to architecture, engineering, and construction industries. So I'm going to soon pass it off to uh, 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 Omid and, and uh, Rebecca, um, and you'll see this recording where they're kind of talking through the kind of this collaborative exchange um, from their perspective. And I want you to keep in mind that while they're talking, that I was actually running a whole set of parallel experiments in my working context, which is that I'm a professor in an architecture school. So I was running a seminar while we were having these design exchanges. And a really interesting thing happened, which is that the students being involved um, to some extent with the workshops were getting new ideas for their work projects. They would produce work. I would share it with my collaborators. And then our work kind of started taking on new directions. So keep that in the back of your mind as you're watching this video. I'm going to hand it off to them. And then I'll come back and I'll talk to you a little bit more about this uh, particular seminar. Thank you. We also, you know, part of the framework initially was working through how a team, how a team would build something like this. And initially, as our constraints kept changing, it was important to define the constraints. For instance, things like the thickness or size of each of the units we were going to use, there were specific material limitations that Jonathan taught us about in terms of you know, you have to put this into an oven or um, there's a certain size that's going to become infeasible to have it actually dry out, right? Um, and so that what you're seeing here um, 
was sort of looking at all those different constraints, defining each of them as a variable. And then Omid was able to produce a visual tool where you could toggle between as the different constraints change, what that would do to the geometry and the visuals of the structure. And then from my perspective, you know, the load path was changing as all of these changes were made as well. Um, and, you know, some of them produce significant amounts of tension, what you're seeing here in the middle image, um, that blue line is tension forming at the top of this uh, ziggurat structure, which was one of our first prototypes, um, more on the block masonry side. And, you know, we were looking at, could it actually resist that tension? How could we move the center of gravity so this becomes more efficient? And if we are locking, these blocks together, can they, do they have enough stability to resist the forces? So let me, this, this, this uh, kind of quantitative, qualitative, analytical uh, tools and processes we tested was kind of giving us ideas about how to proceed. It was teaching us um, the same idea as you say, we are building these blocks here and these are like big blocks. Um, what does this, mean in terms of structural behavior and then the tension how do you resolve the tension uh, it was not just to design and engineer it was the constant process of how can the design change based on these observations and um, analytical processes we are doing so it was quite interesting it kind of leads us to the next step every time we go through these processes right and we kept learning more about the material even things like it could weld together effectively. There was um, a group of students that studied the option of like micro welding, which is really over time, the material could start to mold either with itself or with another reinforcement that would create additional structural capacity. So with some of these unique forces that were getting generated, there was, then Jonathan was coming back to us with different ways we could potentially resolve those forces. So it was really comes back to that, that collaboration, that roundabout collaboration where it's not just us presenting something and the builder reacting to it, but us, us reacting to it together. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, between all of these research and developments, brainstormings, and um, the studies we did, we, part of this uh, project was having workshops and presentations. And so, uh, as part of these, we realized that um, it would be a good idea to use digital technologies to engage the audience with this. So, this happened through a series of uh, web based tools, analytical tools that was kind of exploring these ideas. This is one of them that basically uh, shows the forces uh, throughout the construction of uh, ziggurat or this uh, spiral stair we designed. This was a kind of a case study to see and engage the audience with the process through digital tools, um, which was interesting. We got very some interesting feedbacks from it and a good engagement. Yeah, I think it, it just, everything has an equal reaction or opposite reaction in terms of, oh, I want it to be taller. Uh, your forces might get higher. I want it to be wider. That actually might be more efficient. And, you know, architecture, this was more of a, I'm not going to say a folly structure, but this wasn't a structure that had to comply with ADA or step heights. But, you know, if you look at things like the, the number of steps, that's also going to change the geometry. So sort of defining all those inputs and how they interact with, with each other. And this is a really great way to visualize that. Absolutely. I want to just second that um, that is true. We had um, kind of a commission. So these are real world structures then had real world um, restrictions, uh, what is the trends arise, or these have the um, certain ranges that you should comply with, then it changes the geometry, it changes the structural behavior. So we, we could study these interactions. That's, that's a very important thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want and to talk about it? You know, <laughs> like all projects, you yeah. receive feedback from your clients. And I, I think, you know, concurrent with this, there was the research on sheets being done with uh, Jonathan's students. And this was something that was really exciting in terms of looking at light structures. Form finding was used to, to create these forms similar to the Heinz Eastler method of um, allowing it to, to find its form and then putting it um, upside down so it ends up in compression. But 
looking at these thin sheets and and sort of the opportunities that opened up to have us move away from the building blocks idea, um, both structurally, but also from a design iteration standpoint. Yeah, exactly. This was uh, interesting. It was, they, were, they were exploring this uh, idea of form finding from the color shapes moving towards a compression process. But also, uh, this is one of the teams was working on this. And uh, it kind of ties into that behavior that this which is unique to mycelium that is in this intermediate phase when there is still moisture in the matrix, the mycelium sheets show a significant flexibility. So if they are flexible, they came with this idea that uh, it allows the mycelium sheets to take curvature to create curved surfaces without any form work. So this, this become another um, idea for us to create a uh, conceptual uh, structures out of. So it is kind of tied into this idea of, yeah, this is very interesting and quite unique. So what if we use that as to rationalize complex geometries and build them without formwork instead of putting a formwork and put it on them, just build them by simply hanging pieces. I think to the conversation of formwork and sustainability, that was always an important discussion because when you think of construction waste and energy, there's also the process of making it. For instance, an arch is very efficient in its final state, but requires an incredible amount of form work um, in the interim state. It's not stable until that last keystone is in. And that did give us pause as we were thinking through these different ideas, because we didn't want to be using this great sustainable, reusable material that could you know, have a cradle to cradle lifespan, but then have to build some crazy stuff in order to support it temporarily. So it, you know, it was an exciting idea of how could we explore using less formwork or no formwork at all in order to um, achieve what we were looking to do. Um, yeah, that, uh, what you just mentioned was the, the complexity of this. When, when, once we have an idea and then think about it, and try to explore that idea, we realize we need to look at the full life span. We need to look at the design engineering fabrication, uh, the life of it after its life span, what happens. Uh, and even we realize each of these steps are a very interesting, complicated and interconnected. And uh, you're right, if removing from work, then we have the scaffolding for design. So what kind of a structural systems can, play a role that they can be actually um, stable as they're constructed. So all these ideas all together, we had some um, experimental designs on these ideas, how how this gives us freedom uh, of geometry, how then geometry can have a structural role controlling densities. And then that idea that, oh, this material is a composite based on the substrate you use, it can represent a certain type of hue that the student came up with. And, we use that as, uh, as a conceptual design work for this pavilion. Then again, in, in, in our conversations with the clients, wh what are the needs? What is the next step? How this can be an actual pavilion or something that responds to a specific need at the glass house? Hang <clears throat> cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the question of the internal matrices as well, and um, sort of how what fibers and such could could add additional strength to the sheet. Exactly. Um, so again, another branch of this idea of creating mycelium structures by simply hanging them um, as a fabrication technique, and then the idea of how do we scale this up. Uh, is that a kind of, let's say, um, that the monolithic structure, is this a modular structure connected? How do we bring in uh, the strengths into this matrix? Still, it's not quite um, a strong material intention. So all these ideas merge with the idea of bio-welding you mentioned, that um, mycelium sheets or mycelium material can self-heal and bind to the uh, nearby uh, surfaces of mycelium. So this is quite unique. This is the living material, right? This is not a, this is not a, a, a man-made a composite. And these are the kind of qualities that we were exploring and speculating on. Um, and in response to the client's needs, 
um, they're talking about uh, a space within the sculpture gallery glass house, which is um, a space built all the surfaces are built, most of the surfaces are built out of uh, concrete. Uh, it has a glass ceiling. So there were um, requirements about a shading system, a shading system which has multiple performances. The acoustics of that space is a concern. How this uh, shading system can uh, enhance the acoustical quality of the space and things like this. And then we wanted to merge this idea of building or fabrication technique, making geometries out of mycelium sheets. This brings us here. Yeah, and the um you know, looking, say, at the, the Phoenix and the sizes of those sheets, um, and we came up with these designs, and then we looked at them again, coming back to the building blocks of the team structure we created throughout the, uh, throughout the project, and I'm looking at it from a load resolution standpoint. If we're going to have something like this floating in midair, what's the minimal number of vertical hanging elements that we need connected up to the existing structure? And if we're hanging, how are we actually picking up the edge of this somewhat friable, friable sheet? Um, Jonathan weighing in on ways to sort of stiffen the corners and what's the sort of maximum size that would really be feasible to get this kind of curvature within this light constraint. So it, you know, booted it back to the, um, the design leading, the material leading and sort of them feeding off of each other in terms of, um, how we got this, how we got to this point. Yeah, exactly. That was the point that we realized we need further research and development in the engineering side of this and fabrication as well. The scale was an issue. Um, yeah. um, the scale to build up to that scale uh, still requires further development. Um, on all these uh, explorations we have had some uh, digital prototyping engineering work and physical prototyping. This is a kind of prototype of the Phoenix that uh, Jonathan did at their lab. Um, smaller scale, but the concept was explored through a physical uh, prototype, uh, which was quite interesting and kind of encouraging that this is a, a potential way to approach this um, through further research and development into a material and a structure maybe some interesting ideas uh, can uh, come out of this process. Um, at the same time, we were focusing on um, the clients, uh, clients' needs, and the kind of a commission we had to work with a type of uh, final product based on all of the uh, collaborations we did. And at this point, we were looking more into the uh, natural geometries and forms and the performances that existed in a uh, fruiting body of mycelium, which is the mushrooms. And this kind of led us to um, develop further our design, which is um, Corolla that you see in the exhibition today. So, I mean, what do you think in terms of, you know, doing this one year process where it is a hypothetical commission and, you know, how we can sort of learn from that and how it can teach us as as the builders and as well as the students. Like, what do you think about sort of the way we undertook this journey together? Um, well, the, I think it was, um, personally, I really enjoyed working with everybody and uh, especially our work in Selman. Um, well, definitely was a fascinating experience, uh, very, very inspiring. Um, uh, and I personally learned a lot, um, but uh, I think it's also it's just a starting point for uh, us and all the people who are involved or people who are interested. Um, I personally think there are, for me, there are two ways to look at this material. One is the materiality of this is a natural composite, looking at it, finding the properties, designing, engineering, which basically we were involved in mostly. Um, but I would say we just scratched the surface even in that area. But the other area that I'm, is even more interesting is that looking at this as a process, in that sense, we don't look at it as a material, but look at it as a, as a, a biological organism. It is highly adaptive, right? It, it creates the symbiotic relationships with other organisms. 
what are what are the things we can learn from that? How are the translation of those into engineering and architecture? We haven't even touched those areas. So a lot, a lot is to, to be explored. Yeah. Yeah, I would How agree. To some degree, it feels like we're sort of scratching the surface of, of a lot of potential. Um, I think the, the process of having it be a fictional commission, which could someday turn into a very real commission, hopefully, um, it was interesting because you it removes all the barriers um, associated with the normal project, both financially, um, as well as, you know, all the different logistics of pressures involved with, with regular projects. You could really step back and think of a big picture and open your mind. Um, but on the same time, it's with the material that have never been used before in this context. So it was pretty exciting to explore it in that way. And I think for me, having the the students' involvement and seeing the research, it, it just became very clear a lot of this is about continuing to grow this material in these different forms, testing it, seeing how it does. You know, one of the things Dennis said at the beginning of the project was, um, I'm not afraid if this fails, like and as an engineer, you're like, well, I don't want to hear that. But the point was, we want to be pushing this material to the point where it might fail. And it's it's just going to be, it's, it's not the same thing as when we design buildings or we use factors of safety and absolutely have to stay within the constraints of public safety, at this point, we're actually pushing a material, a new material, using it in a new way. It's not really a new material. It's been around forever, but a new use for this material um, and and be not being afraid to to fail almost, to, to see where it can go. So um, I think what I'd love to see from here is, you know, further collaboration on the research side. And I think that almost has to lead the charge um, and then the structural constraints get defined based on that. Um, you know, switching from having it be a compression only structure to these opportunities to push it farther than that. I think that was really exciting. And uh, yeah, again, I, it just to approach it in the way of looking at the process as a team and how we how we brought it back to that master builder concept. And that that was exciting as well. Absolutely. I think the, the key to all of this was what you just mentioned, that uh, the freedom and liberation of, um, yes, we are not, we're not worried about this being failed. This is a, kind of a research project and a collaboration, but also we um, impose some real world constraints to it, right? When you have, um, when you have these two and um, a good support uh, of the full team, uh, many exciting things can happen, like the, the explorations and ideation can go beyond the bounds that um, are confined by the uh, economics of the design and things like that. So it was wonderful, wonderful uh, um, opportunity to start working with that. And I guess further support and uh, further um, progress in the research side is the key for us to move this, uh, a lot of these concepts and ideas that we explored and developed, uh, find their way to be materialized and um, yeah, be used in uh, residential architecture and beyond. Absolutely, yeah, I think it's a very exciting material for use in that context and I'm excited to see what, what happens next. Uh, so as you, can you all hear me? All right. So um, as you can all see, using a new material for a residential project is rather difficult. Um, and I think there's something very unique that you all saw there, which is that there was a real interaction between a professional project, albeit speculative, 
but there was this relationship between a speculative project and an academic research laboratory. And um, I think this is pretty unique. And um, I think for really actually uncovering um, what the future of construction is going to be, quite frankly, is very essential. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about what was going on in the background. I think you saw some little images throughout uh, Omid and Rebecca's presentation, but I'm going to fill you in a little bit more about what was going on. So first of all, I want to say that the class that I'm teaching, and this is a class that I've taught um, for many years now, is really an opportunity for me to fully integrate my research into my teaching and really transporting my students to the front lines of inquiry into questions of sustainability, uh, of construction, um, and, and ultimately like how we're going to build uh, in, in the future, that question that I asked at the, at the beginning of my talk. So um, the Myco Matters seminar is really just a branch of my research lab. And it's that, it's that way for my students to get involved uh, in, in what I'm doing. So for that particular semester in spring 2021, um, we were growing house parts. This is what we were talking about um, in, in the mycelium project. And because in my work, making things physically as the proof is fundamentally what I do. Ideas are proven physically with prototypes. And so this is really the, the charge that was placed on my students. So um, really what we were focused on and, and a major goal of this, this particular course was for students to actually play with the material, develop ways of actually using it and, and fabricating with it, but then actually scaling those techniques up to the scale of a recognizable part of a house. And so you're going to see things like columns and screen walls and spiral staircases. And, and these were the, the products of um, that class. So I'll start with the Myco woven column. Now, one of the issues that you heard being talked about by Rebecca and Omid was this question of formwork. So if you think back to the project that I showed uh, earlier, there was this kind of intense amount of material that went into making that singing pavilion, that choral pavilion. Uh, and it was all waste material. The pavilion itself was there. Sure, it's great that it was made of mycelium, but there were, you know, dozens and dozens of pounds worth of plywood and plastic that went into making that. And that really presents an ethical dilemma with this material, is that if we have to waste material in order to be more sustainable, we're not, we're only being less bad and we're not trying to, we're not actually doing good. So um, this was an issue that a couple of my students really took up. So they really kind of engaged this question of formwork with that pavilion from 2018 and said, well, how do we take the unsustainable part of that pavilion and make it more sustainable? So they had this idea of actually using basket weaving techniques as a way of making a container or a formwork um, in which the mushroom would grow. And you can see some of their preliminary experiments where they're using these basket weaving techniques, filling them with a living mushroom, and then letting the mushroom grow through and across that skin. So what you get is a structure that actually has an exoskeleton. And so it actually is reinforcing it um, structurally, but then also produces no waste because the container in which the material is growing becomes an integrated part of that structure. So again, remember, the, the idea here is that the students kind of discover a way of making that's, that's unique and that's something that I guide them with, and they try to scale up that technique to make something recognizable. So here, um, you see a column. The students spent uh, dozens and dozens of hours basket weaving this column together, and here you're just seeing a little time lapse of them actually putting in the mulch uh, into this column. Now, we can't be perfect. There is no free lunch when it comes to, to sustainable construction. So you see that actually in order to create the proper environment for, these, uh, for the fungi to grow, they actually had to wrap the structure in plastic. Now, the plastic did just what it needed to do, uh, providing a warm, sterile enough um, and dark environment for, um, for the mushroom to actually grow and, and begin to grow across all of, all of those fibers. Um, now... Growing with mushrooms has a major, major difficulty, which I didn't really talk about earlier, which is that contaminations happen all the time. And contaminations actually do ruin and cause failure in growing parts. Um, so the ambition of this particular column was for the mushroom to grow all the way across that basket weaving material. 
But unfortunately, during the six, seven day growth process, a very, a very dangerous um, and undesirable fungi uh, appeared. Um, basically the green and the black stuff that you know you're not supposed to have in your house. Um, that stuff started to emerge and we had to, to really stunt the growth. We sprayed the column down with, with alcohol actually um, in order to stop the growth of, of both our mushroom, which we, which we wanted to grow, and then uh, these, these contaminants. Um, but ultimately, uh, the inside of the column, everything that was inside the basket weaving material, we know this because we actually took some cross sections of it later, um, it did manage to grow. And, and so really presenting, um, I think, a, a really uh, a lot of potential to start looking at the way that textile crafts and, and other traditional crafts can start to come in to play um, and actually provide sustainable solutions um, when, when growing these materials. So I'll keep moving on here. Uh, one of the um, one of the references that you heard about was something called myco welding. So I'll explain that very briefly. Um, and I also want to put into context the um, the first structure that Omid and Rebecca showed, this kind of stepped uh, pavilion uh, kind of thing. So the students saw that presentation and got really got really inspired and started to ask me, well, how might we actually do that. And I said, well, you know, you're not going to make this little pavilion. If you want to do something like that, we have to, first of all, start focusing our attention toward, um, toward what it would be and then how, how you would actually make it, that it's this kind of stepped thing. Fine. Let's make some steps. Number two, how would you actually go about doing something like that? Um, so the students started to experiment with a technique that's um, called myco welding, which basically involves taking two living pieces of, of myco material composite. So at the moment that you've grown it in the mold for a, in, in the formwork for a certain amount of time, you have the growth that has kind of come all the way through. You can remove it from its, its formwork at that moment. And it is this kind of gelatinous, fairly fragile um, object. But if you take a living object and you introduce it to another living object, a unique property of these materials is that they actually grow into one another and they bind. So think about mortar between bricks. This is self-generating mortar. Uh, so the students were really um, beginning their exploration by looking at um, what, what does it look like when we start to bring two materials together. You can see these are their early experiments. You see how the materials are looking a little gray, a little strange colored. Again, contaminations happen, and these were things that those students were working through. But what they actually discovered is that the best bond between two living mycomaterial parts is just putting them together with a little bit more substrate. So that really inspired this kind of, I don't know, like mid, uh, like really kind of medieval style of construction, taking big blocks of myco materials that they grew in these uh, foam molds and starting to stack them along a, a column. You can see they're basically learning how to be, uh, yeah, the sort of medieval masons at the same time that they're doing something like totally futuristic here. So you see them actually stacking living uh, uh, stair wedges. Bear in mind that this is a half scale prototype, um, but you can see them taking these wedges and, and they're living at the time. You see they're wearing gloves and they're actually putting more inoculated material in between there as a, as a mortar, basically leveling out each step as they went up. Um, and uh, I mean, really it, it worked swimmingly. Um, the problem of course, is that when you're growing these things longer and longer and longer, the fungus gets, um, gets very competitive and, and, and wants to start to, to reproduce. And so um, these, these mushrooms actually started to grow. The mushroom is a fruit uh, as far as the, the, fung the fungus is concerned. And the fruit is really there for um, deploying spores uh, as a means of reproduction. And if you keep the mycelium growing long enough and you keep, keep, it, keep giving it it's these favorable conditions, um, these, these mushrooms um, appear. The other thing is that this object was rather large. And because we can, we kept giving it this favorable, favorable conditions, we didn't have an oven big enough to put it in, in order to, to dry the thing out immediately. So we had to air dry it. And as, and in that process, because it took roughly a month for it to lose about 70% of its water content, the fungus was still alive for a very long time and produced these kind of wonderful bracket mushrooms. Um, these are, these are kind of in the category of reishi. Uh, mushrooms that you're seeing here. 
um, and, and uh, you know, really, really wonderful. But what's amazing here is that the steps themselves are actually fully, fully bonded. And I, and I want to point out that the work that the students did was really pivotal because just about a year later, um, earlier this spring, I worked with a different set of students this time at UVA, and they grew um, using that exact same technique of like making large slab like pieces and they grew those pieces into one another in this kind of undulating wall form that i think really starts to to imply um, the work that we were doing at the beginning of the mice the mycelium project so again the lab really functioning as the catalyst for how we would actually do something that we might design right that we can design things but how we would do that with mycelium materials is not implicit and and we do need to actually uh, figure out how to do that um, experimentally Okay, last are these sheets. So how did we even get to the Corolla? How, how can we, how is it that we even imagine that mycelium could start to take these kind of really um, voluptuous and, and, and really kind of organic forms? So what was happening is that we were having these discussions and I was just setting up my lab at that time at Kansas and, and starting to play with some materials. I was growing them in these cooking sheets and um, beginning this experimentation with, okay, we know this material when it's in a rigid formwork, um, we can make it big and small, that's a scalable thing. How else can we use it? And I was playing with these materials when they were alive. So these sheets, when you grow them and, and they're still alive, they're very, very flexible to a point. You have to be careful how much you flex them. You can see here, there's a moment where I flexed it a little bit too much and it tore. But this was something that I was experimenting with while the seminar was getting up and running and the students were starting to develop their research projects. And so this, so one of the groups that I was working with was really picked this up and, and kind of went with it. And we were strategizing how might you actually use this flexible nature of these sheets in a useful way. Um, so like I do with a lot of my work is first we look at history. What have we done historically as humans to build when we're talking about flexible materials? Um, well, in the, in the late uh, 19th and, and 20th centuries, we have two really fantastic examples in Antony Gaudí and Heinz Isler who are using uh, flexible materials to inspire forms that can then later be built. Um, Gaudí famously hung these strings upside down in order to then inspire the shape of, of the Hagia, of the, um, sorry, not the Hagia Sophia, the Sagrada Familia um, in Barcelona. And, and, and the, the, the church itself that is still being built was actually generated by a physical model that was hung upside down. And so we thought maybe this is potent ground to explore. So the students went at it absolutely naive, um, absolutely with no fear of failure here. Um, started to grow their sheets. They started to really look at, at, at different ways that they could put more material at the edges where they knew the stresses were going to be higher. And they developed this really intricate system of how to hang these sheets. And in some ways to even bring some level of control and intention to the, uh, to the forms themselves that they were making. So they developed these kind of ways of, of mass producing these things and ended up with a screen wall. And what's really interesting about this is that, um, you know, really, these are kind of the mini versions of what we've uh, what we've been talking about all along. And and again, I want to really just reinforce how important that the this work that the students were exploring um, was, because when it, as our work in the mycelium project continued, um, the work in the lab also continued, right? And so as these uh, sort of expressions um, and forms were coming out of the design process for the mycelium project, we were trying to continually try to, you know, sort of achieve these, these things that were coming out of, uh, out of Silman. And so here, this is the Myco chandelier, um, it was briefly presented by Omid, but you're seeing something that was basically these large, large sheets. So taking what the students had done with that little screen wall and kind of really try to scale it up in the context of a three credit seminar, students can only get so far. And this idea of sheets was so new that there was nothing really for them to kind of uh, fall back on. And, and here, what we were able to do is then scale up their efforts and bring in a, a, a layer of, of control. So in the video that you're seeing here, the students are actually holding phones that are projecting a digital, uh, a digital model through their phones. And so they're actually guiding the bending process with augmented reality. And this, was re this is, again, really something um, that was very, very new and very low tech in the sense that 
Um, we were using an, a phone based version of this. Um, so the, the next, you know, the next version is of course using much more sophisticated augmented reality uh, uh, technologies. But again, really kind of getting to the point that the physical prototype was really inspired by this collaborative exchange that we were um, a part of and and that the that the forms that were coming out of this problem of working for a client needing some residential object uh residential scale object that you know sort of hung um and filtered um that there were techniques that needed to underpin um these these uh these requests um and again the the, the work kind of continually evolves and so even last spring when i was working with a set of students they kind of went back to this technique of forming large quantities of slab material um, while they were alive and, and using gravity. Here you can see in the, in the bottom corner here, you see these, these kind of bone and petal shaped uh, slabs that are actually being hung and formed through gravity and then assembled together in this hanging structure. So uh, again, I just really want to emphasize how enjoyable um, the collaboration was and how um, really potent it was toward making progress uh, with with building uh, uh, with this brand new material. So just to conclude, um, adopting new materials into the architecture, engineering, and construction industry is really challenging, as I hope I've uh, communicated today. But um, I also want to point out how necessary it is. Right? It, it is extremely necessary that we actually work with these materials. And importantly, um, we have a history of construction. We have a history of our, our, our traditions and our crafts. Um, but when it comes to a new material, they're a good place to start. But when it comes to designing with these new materials and how to build them at architectural scale, we cannot assume anything. And so experimentation, physically working with these materials, I think is really essential. Um, and continued collaboration like we've seen um, over these last 18 months with the Mycelium Project is, is you know, really, really, really pivotal. So uh, with that, I hope that kind of prompts enough uh, fodder for discussion. Um, I want to thank you for, uh, for being here tonight. And um, we're going to have a little uh, discussion and then open up for question and answer. Um, thank you so much. Jonathan. Yes. Hey. I'm hey. Hoping we hey, Namita. Oh, you're by back. side soon. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's the one thing that I missed in this um, collaboration was really going through this with your students. And I know that Omid and Rebecca were very much part of it. So I just wanted the audience to know that, you know, although we only presented, um, you know, in these workshops three times in the course of the year, all throughout that time in between, you, the three of you were, were working with the students and that back and forth was just so amazing what they've come up with and, and really it fed this project in a way like it never, I, I don't know what we would have ended up with if, if it weren't for the students, essentially. Totally. Um, I mean, I remember the day that we were starting to grow sheets and we had our, you know, sort of like bi-weekly meeting. Yeah. And I was like, that, oh, that was I'm the aha I'm, moment. Like we were yeah, it's have, like, oh, yeah. I'm getting growing. Oh, what are you growing? A sheet. And the sheet went like <laughs> this, right? Like the sheet kind of made that like yeah, upside down I remember down how, excite, how excited you were about that, to share that when, when that happened, you know, that Well, moment. and the funny thing is that to me, Again, as uh, my role in, in our collaboration being the builder, uh, I was sort of like, well, of course it does that. And you all were sort of like, well, but what can we do with that? And I was exactly. like, well, anything. Yeah. What do yeah. you, I mean, yeah. like, let's, let's try something. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it really was. And, and there was really this sense of breathing when it came to this collaboration where there, you know, there was a sort of an, a, a give and a, a take and a give and a take um, kind of on both sides. And. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fascinating the, yeah. the way that that you know academic work and industry work, which are so often siloed. Um, I think we're re through this, we're really able to show that um, actually they're much more interdependent. Yeah, yeah, and and also it was a residential commission, right? So we were able to, um, as, as a custom residential commission too, we were able to you know throw everything at it because it was a it was a mighty fine challenge by our right. client asking mm -hmm. us to you know make sure that 
it hung and it and it filtered and and that's mm -hmm. something that I guess you have never really experienced working with mycelium until until that challenge came along. That's right. Up until our discussions, the baseline assumption of this material is that it works in compression. Yeah. Right? And you can read papers that'll say it like it's all over the place. And if you look at the work up until now, um, all of those pavilion structures are assuming that the material is pushed on. And at the moment that the client expresses this sort of disdain for this heaviness, right? They say, well, but mushrooms are like, they fly, right? They float, they cantilever. Yeah. And How you kind bring... of want it to look like that bracket mushroom, right? You want Absolutely. it to look like they, the yeah, form they, that yeah. the actual thing itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that was a that was a great moment um and a very pivotal moment in the project. And it's gonna be exciting to see where we take that next for 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 uh this coming fall, the mm -hmm. work that we do together. Yeah. Yeah. Um also just just going back to this thing that that it's a residential commission right we have this um special ability to really to to kind of experiment right mm -hmm. when when clients ask us to like you know to design something that's so hard or impossible to design but they're ready to like pay for it right so right. so we get to experiment and we get to come up with these things which i don't think really happens in other architectural commissions as readily. That's true. Uh, and we, why... we, talk, we talked about that a lot in the way that, that residential architecture is actually very unique in terms of buildings um, because they are much more personal. They are experimental. They have a, his they have a long history of being extremely experimental, um, even just within you know, the sort of scope of time that the architect is a person who has a role. Um, in the building process, um, right? And that, and that the house, the, the sort of residential scale is the place where these kind of very deep, very, very risky um, experimentations start to happen. So yeah. um, there was reference of, of Dennis, who was kind of the ringleader and the person who brought us all together. Um, you know, this expression of, well, I don't care if it fails. It, it's very much within this, this attitude of residential architecture and how it is actually a very, very fantastic context um, for trying to push the boundaries. Yeah. So what other boundaries do you see um, that, that, that could be pushed? That I still, I, I still think we have everything to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it, it's, you know, self-critically, um, even though, yeah, we managed to kind of mimic or at least um, achieve some of the expressions that we were designing, um, with these materials, we're still not talking about a house, right? And yeah, and so for me, so far from it. we're still very, very far from it. Um, so scale is always going to be a problem. Access to materials, the 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 there is a micro material industry that is working at commercial scale, but it's still not at the point where if I want, I mean, I could definitely come up with how to grow the house. I've gotten pretty close in terms of that scale, but the 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 logistics um, that go into moving that much living material, the risk of growing um, that much material in, in in different kinds of conditions, unless you have the resources to basically have a building that's bigger than a house and then grow the house in that building and then an oven that can dry that house, it's pretty tough. So there's there's a lot to do. I think we uncovered quite a bit in the sense that we made a column we made a staircase that works. Um, These are all house think, parts. <laughs> yeah, they're all house parts. And so really what it is, it's, it's I think from a structural side, if, if that's how we think it's going to be used, which may or may not be the best use of this material, we, it's, still, it's still up for debate. Um, we have to start to think not only how do these parts actually start to assemble, but then I think what are the other materials that might get involved? If we... You know, we, we've talked about this a lot in Amita. A house is not made of one material, right? So to think that mycelium materials are going to be the like catch all of everything that's going to make a house, I think is like way too naive. And so I think really, you know, and the, the, very the, purist. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and probably impractical um, in the long term. So I think it really becomes about where are there other material synergies? What is this thing really good for? We know it has acoustical properties. We know it can be structure if you can deploy enough of it. 
it has a strength to ratio st strength to weight ratio that's better than concrete so think about that for a second if you have a material that is has a strength to weight ratio that's better than concrete if you can put enough of it out there it's stronger than concrete so that's useful perhaps um but still you're not going to make a bridge out of this stuff yet it's all it is you, you do have questions of of moisture and the fact that this this because it is essentially made of a composite of mulch that yeah, if it becomes a humid environment, it starts to swell and starts to expand and contract. Um, there is even the possibility of, of in the wrong kinds of environmental conditions to have um, new kinds of organisms and contaminants that may appear. But let's be frank, that's still the kind of thing that we see in our houses today. Like black mold is a problem that we see in homes and they're not yet made of mycelium. So I think the same kinds of issues that we have in our homes today are still going to be there if we're using mycelium. But it's about finding that right recipe, you know, of, of materials that are going to um, kind of allow us to make these new kind of material expressions, but still achieve the minimum goals that buildings have. And, you know, something that these hanging structures, these pavilions are still not quite getting us to. Yeah. And it's going to take a lot of time for it's sure. It's going to take a lot of time yeah. and a lot of material, right? Um you know, yeah. just just to move a couple pallets of this stuff is is a lot it it yeah. you know and i do it but it it does take a lot of work and so having the the infrastructure even just the volume of material that would be needed to to start to operate at that level um you know. i think that 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 the takeaway from going from the the sort of heavy structure the monolithic structure to the sheets was that we were also being extremely resourceful with getting right. away from from form work and um you know that that's a, that was like a beautiful thing when that happened mm -hmm. and that was quite ingenuous too, to yeah. come up with something like that totally like think, using something that you have and a behavior that you kind of come across and kind of leverage it right like actually it yeah. has these inherent like these these things that we have around us have these inherent properties and and i think what we ended up stumbling upon is a new inquiry into, well, if it has this behavior, like how can this be useful to us? Yeah. It did get us away from kind of standing structure. Yeah. Yeah. But the nice thing is that the engineers got just as excited about something hanging as something standing, right? It's yeah. they say, okay, well, it's a different structural action that can still be very useful. I'm sure the shakers thought that way too. Yeah. <laughs> they were deciding <laughs> just the, the resourcefulness and the ingenuity of, of the things they designed. Absolutely. You know? So yeah, but um, uh, should we take a few questions? I think there are a few questions here. Um, yeah, I've been I've been kind of uh, taking a look. Do you, do you maybe want to moderate or take, kind of pick a yeah. few out? Um, would, it be helpful, would it be helpful if I read a few out? That would be awesome. Thank you. Great, great. We have some great ones coming in, and I think you kind of addressed the the first question, Jonathan, and that was from Barry, and that was how in outdoor installations are not quickly deformed by precipitation and humidity. Yeah, they they totally are. And the structure that I shared in my first in the first part of my presentation um, was a temporary structure. Um, so you know, going back to kind of the the motivation, the sort of charge of all of this work is that we have to question whether or not the structures that we build are meant to be permanent, and if permanence is really important. So when I use mycelium, it's specifically for impermanent applications. And and so you know, I think in that case, you know, we really honestly. We chopped up the structure and threw it away. I've been a little bit more resourceful than that uh, when it has come to disposing my, proje my, my projects more recently. Um, but ultimately, these are compostable. If, if they can encounter an active uh, composting agent, so this is usually another organism. If you think about a compost pile, there are plenty of organisms that are actively um, breaking things apart. Um, so yeah, they don't do very well. And, and again, I, I think if you're going to use them structurally, I think it's really important to think about how we use materials for structure already. Um, if you think about the studs in a house, we protect them on both sides with several layers, right? And I think if we were going to be using mycelium as a structure, we would do exactly the same thing. We would protect our structure in the way that we do. So that's a great observation. And Jordana had a similar question and hers was how, how a structure would hold up under uh, the conditions simulating like an earthquake or hold up in certain weather. And what would happen if it sustains damage? How could it be quickly repaired? 
Yeah. So one of the things that people are really interested about this material is that at least when it's alive, it has uh, basically self-repairing properties. Um, now, this presents a very both interesting uh, ground for inquiry, but also a lot of problems because now we're talking about something that is performing structurally, is alive um, at the same time. And, and I think it poses a lot of challenges, although I think it's really potent as, as an idea. Um, now, there's also this idea that you can actually bring these materials back to life. Again, the, the complexity of the environmental conditions for something like that to happen um, is difficult. I think what's more exciting is that if you have to replace a part that's damaged, you just grow another one and the broken part can be thrown into a field and turn into a, you know, a bed of flowers the next year. Um, and that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, I think when it comes to resistance of, of forces such as earthquakes, um, building form, structural form has a lot to do with the structure's capacity to resist those kinds of forces. Um, so we have, you know, bracing mechanisms and shear wall, um, we can use mass in different ways in order to resist these kinds of forces. And there's no reason to think that, that just like our other materials, um, that they would be, be, be able to do that. Again, though, we're talking about a really careful coordination between form, assembly, and then just having healthy build, building parts that you've at this point grown in our hypothetical situation. That's great. Daniela asked um, or, or commented, there's a lot of deep knowledge that has been created from the seminars and workshops, which is remarkable. However, it can be very difficult for people to learn from one another because the information is so new. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere where you have published your tips, observations, scientific methods in a way for mycelium growth, growing for architectural prototyping? So uh, yeah, as an academic, a part of my work and part of my output is publications, and those are more or less available. Um, and there is a whole, a whole community of academic researchers who are publishing papers um, in, in um, relevant and, and, and uh, you know, sort of well-respected journals that are talking about these things, and they do divulge a lot of, of these kinds of um, techniques. Now, I will say that there is a lot of catching up that we're doing because when it comes to the biological work, mycomaterial industry has been very closed door, very black box mm -hmm. about that research. And so the trouble is that because of sort of commercialization um, and you know, sort of economic needs of a business, a lot of that, a lot of the knowledge when it comes to um, the science of cultivating these kinds of materials is actually protected um, intellectual property. And so those of us in academia are, are kind of faced with this issue of having to repeat science um, in, with, within a time span of about 15 years. So I have a number of colleagues in Europe who have basically taken this, this issue head on and are in their labs every single day replicating the kinds of things that companies like MycoWorks and Ecovative are doing, which is fantastic. Um, but because those are secret, there is no publication. So there are journals. Um, Biomimetics um, is one of them I've published in, in a number of different venues, and, and you can absolutely find them. Um, my recommendation is use Google Scholar and use mycelium as your keyword search, and then go after the thing that you want to know about, um, about mycelium uh, in that context. The other thing I would say is that those of us in this research community are young and energetic, and we're also very generous in terms of our time and our, our willingness to talk about it. Um, and so I would say that if, if you're not finding something, um, find someone who you see is doing something like me and, and reach out because um, I have a number of different calls throughout the week that, that you know, or a student somewhere doing something or someone who's done this. Um, so, so look around, it's there, it's, but it is hard because look, to be quite frank, we are on a new frontier of this. And so it's not like looking up how to build something with wood or how to build something with reinforced concrete. It, th there are no textbooks yet, but I think we're getting there. And our yeah, last yeah. question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I was going to say, we, um, just sort of, also, you know, people can watch the videos that 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 we have on the AIA New York CRAN site, which I'll probably drop in the in the chat for people. Um, they're not as technical, but there are, like, for example, the the um, webinar we had two years ago. We had 
five different people speak on it from different backgrounds and there was some technical aspects that were discussed. So that mm -hmm. could be helpful um, for anyone who's interested. So I will drop that in the in the chat. Yeah, I'll also drop a chat, a link in the chat um, for a, a different lecture series that I was a part of that had uh, experts from around the globe, specifically looking at um, sort of a broader range of issues. I mean, keep in mind that our project was really focused on residential architecture and at that scale. Um, but if you're interested in this thing, in, in these topics at large, uh, I'll drop a link that that kind of really gets all over the place, whether it's 3D printing or using mycelium as a computer and electrical source it's there <laughs> and our final uh question from the chat for the evening is from franny who said she'd love to hear more about the composite material that's created for inoculation is your recipe published anywhere uh so full disclosure it's not my recipe i buy it from a company um, so part, like, like I said, there's, there's this kind of issue where people are either having to kind of grow their own and come up with something. And the truth is that there is, um, there's a company called Ecovative or several companies out there, but Ecovative actually sells this composite material in grow it yourself kits. You can go to their website and order it to your home. It comes in a dehydrated bag. And so it is accessible. And what's really nice about this is that there's about 15 years of research behind this material. So it really works. And the truth is that um, my colleagues who are growing their own from sort of forest found species are having a lot more trouble because they haven't found the optimized character to do what we're doing with this material. Um, and keep in mind that different fungal species are going to be useful for different things when we talk about leveraging them for our everyday lives. So um, this material is bought from Ecovative, 100% of it, um, it works. <laughs> you still have to be relatively careful, right? Like, it, again, this this question of, of sanitation, um, the, the need to kind of avoid contamination is is really there. Um, but the nice thing is that their material is is accessible um, and and is pretty aggressive as far as the, the fungal species and really does resist contaminations from other from other organisms quite well. We, we, that's how we grew that structure outside, right? That pavilion was grown outside in Atlanta. Um, so we were careful, but we didn't have to be that careful. I guess if that's it for the questions, um, I, I just wanna thank the Shaker Museum for, for having us tonight. And I hope uh, everyone enjoyed this. And um, I just wanted to thank Jonathan because, uh, you know, I think I mentioned this to you, Lisa, I've never met Jonathan in person. We've <laughs> lived in this COVID world and we worked on this project together for, for now over two years. And I'm looking forward to meeting him in person and, and maybe getting my hands into the material and, and uh, working with his students this fall. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're so well, grateful to you both. Thank you so much for such a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you everyone. And yeah, stay in touch. Good night. Good night. night.